Uh, uh, so let's, let's call this evening's meeting to order. Uh, this is the Board of Public Works. It's May 28th, 2014. Um, typically we have public comment before our meeting. I understand a lot of you are here from the State Street, Church Street area about the recent flooding. Um, I do want to hear your comments. Uh, I'm also going to ask the city engineer, Jim Lorela, if he could get up. Uh, we have a fairly good satellite photo up there and just walk everyone through the hydrology of what's happening around that area. Um, and Jim has some comments and thoughts about ways we might be able to mitigate the flooding yeah. moving forward. So would you like to hear what Jim has to say or would you like to take a few minutes to say what you would like to say? Why don't we hear from people? I think it would be more appropriate for just us to speak at least to what our okay. experience was and then Excellent. hear if that's okay. So um, for the record, I'm Maureen Kearney, uh, the working as a counselor and um, for disclosure also resident of Church Street and impacted last week by the, uh, by the event. Um, I'm not going to take a lot of time because many people here have uh, a lot of damage and uh, experience that goes back 16, 18, or three generations in Jim's case to talk about that area. We're not going to give a whole, you know, three generations worth of history, but um, it's just important to know what we've experienced over these years of living in that area and how it's gotten worse and worse. I will say that uh, Louis Hasbrook, who spent a good deal of time um, during the night of the event and over the next couple of days helping people understand what kind of uh, damage, turning off gas, and where, where people's uh, mechanicals were destroyed, and um, he needed to at least protect the, you know, the safety of the area. He did estimate that just in that area, he thinks for the mechanicals alone is about a $35,000 uh, loss, and it should know that people have no insurance coverage for any of these items. And you'll hear from some people that it's been the third or fourth fur furnace they've had to replace some, uh, uh, you know, a third or fourth appliance in five years. So I think it's um, probably best for me to let folks talk to you. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm, I'm glad to go first. All right. If you want. Would you um, please introduce yourself? Absolutely. I'm Deborah Lambert, and I live at 277 State Street. Um, I bought the house, and I did give a copy of this to Jim. I did send an email with a copy of this to Jim. Um, I bought my house in February of 20, 2008 for $205,000. I share a driveway with Sarah Peters, who's at 279 State Street in Kashmir and Jan Januitz. Um, they're 89 years old. They live at 275 State Street, and they've lived there for decades. So the three of us share a driveway. Um, I have in my records many emails since 2008 about the street, the house, the yard flooding, the beavers, the round hill runoff with massive amounts of silt. I have a book of those. Um, I pay taxes on my house, but at this point I would be unable to sell my house. My house has no worth right now by the time I disclose the flooding. I have had, since 2008, I have had, there's been flooding, major flooding, major flooding. I've had others, but major flooding of the cellar and yard five times since 2008. I've repaired my sump pump twice. I've replaced it three times. I've repaired my hot water three times and replaced the hot water heater twice. They're currently working on a replacement because I'm no longer going to have any mechanicals in the basement. I have a tiny, tiny house. I have a dirt cellar. Um, previous owners had already removed appliances from down there, obviously, I suspect, because there, were, there was plumbing down there for appliances, but I suspect they learned and didn't disclose, of course. But um, so all I have down there at this point, I keep nothing down there. Um, after the first flood, I removed everything that I had down there. Um, I have a sump pump, a hot water heater, and a furnace. And all that will be left after this major flooding will be the sump pump because I'm doing a tankless water heater up in my house, which is about 700 square feet for two of us, which doesn't get very much room for anything. 
that's we just got um, Schneider is putting it in starting tomorrow and it's going to be four thousand um, dollars I replaced my hot water heater last August of 2013 that was the last major flood my furnace has been repaired three times, been replaced twice. We're w awaiting the latest estimate since it's this time of year. The sump pump's been replaced yesterday, and the hot water heater system is going to be put in this week. Right now, we're showering with Shara, Sarah or at, at work, and don't tell them I'm showering at work. Um, the driveway, which we, we purposefully decided to keep it a permeable driveway because of the flooding after we learned about this has been repaired five times and we've kept it non-paved so it's permeable the driveway is destroyed this time he's been lugging a bucket of sand and gravel out of our backyard I'm I'm the very back house if you if you look at our driveway on State Street the houses are um, 275 is right on State Street. The driveway goes in, Sarah's house is on the left, and my house is straight in. And my house becomes, my, our driveway becomes the river. Then I'll show you pictures of that. Um, I want to talk about the most recent, I want to talk about the August of 2013 flooding. I, I will tell you that the first flood that I experienced happened just months after I acquired the house. It happened in the spring of 2008. Um, the street was closed. The street always gets closed when there's flooding. Um, my sump pump was unable to keep up. The cellar flooded. The sump pump was replaced. The dirt floor I had regraded with white stone laid down. Cellar columns had to be replaced. The hot water had to be replaced. And everything was removed from the cellar at, at that point, except the mechanicals. And I installed a dehumidifier hung from the ceiling. The backyard was flooded. The dirt in the sand driveway was damaged and repaired. Um, I had the area around the house regraded in the spring and learned the hard way that we have to plow the driveway a certain way because otherwise the plowing becomes a dam and makes things even worse. Um, this is a picture of the backyard in the winter time with a flood. It was a rain, it was a storm, and there was snow on the ground, and that was my first major one in 2008. I didn't know I was going to be presenting something like this because I certainly never imagined this was going to go on and on and on. Um, we had a terrible time in 2011 with a hurricane that came through, and I don't have pictures or anything of that. Um, in January, on January 30th, 2013, the driveway, the yard, and the cellar flooded. Um, there was a lot of email traffic between Maureen and the city about needing to deal with the stormwater infrastructure and the task force. That's the first I heard about the task force. I've been hearing about beavers and so forth, and we quickly learned after dealing with the beavers that. <laughs> that wasn't the, the major problem. The, the beavers had contributed, but that by itself without the beavers, it's a major problem. In March, there was another um, episode that I don't have pictures of. So then, August of last year, my cellar filled with water. And it didn't go above three feet because by then I'd learned to call the fire department, and the fire department came and pumped my backyard. Um, Re replacing my sump pump, the hot water heater, the furnace, um, and the backyard was flooded. So here's a picture of State Street <coughs> during the flood. This is a picture of our driveway during the August flood. You see, I learned to start taking pictures. Um, this is a picture of my side yard and backyard. Um, ironic that we have kayaks, you know, but that's the river that was running through my property. And this is the backyard with the fire department pumping out the cellar to the backyard because it was the only place they could pump the cellar was to the backyard. All right, so that's August of 2013. So, Deborah, let me um, mm -hmm. ask, ask you to wrap it up just so we have a chance for other people yeah. to speak. 
The same, okay, the same thing. Um, driveway damage, okay. Um, the most recent flood, we were away, Sarah photographed it. We didn't place sandbags. In the meantime, we got sandbags through Ned, um, but they wouldn't have held the water anyway. I mean, the water was way above it. The cellar flooded, the water line showed four feet. The building inspector came and turned off the main gas line. Sump pump failed, now replaced. Hot water heat failed, being replaced for $4,000. Furnish, furnace failed. We don't have an estimate on another one and we're gonna have to do something different. We had standing water remaining in the house for four days and um, the backyard flooded majorly. There was erosion around the house. A sinkhole developed under the deck going to, into, the, into the cellar. There was a sinkhole that reopened on a bank, on the rail trail bank. There's a water drain. There's some kind of a... Well, it's a major sewer main. It's a major sewer main that Probably. doesn't show up on anybody's surveys or anything, but there's this big round manhole. manhole that we finally opened about two or three weeks ago before this storm and looked down in, and it's a huge drain, and there's a huge um, sump, sump, uh, sinkhole that has been developing around that. We've been filling it in, not knowing what that area was until we recently opened it. And the sinkhole is deep again. It's That's gone down a couple of feet on this last event. I suspect it's all related to the storm flooding in the area, the history of it. It's been subsiding over years. This time we, <coughs> we found, um, we were inundated with rats um, appearing in the yard in the cellar. The exterminator relates that to and Frank has seen the rats in the um, sinkhole. Yep, there's a rat den in that sinkhole in around the sewer. And so we're inundated and dealing with an exterminator right now. Um, we're unable to use the backyard for over a week because of mosquitoes. We, we retained water in the backyard until today's the first day that I'm not seeing standing water in the backyard. Right, yeah. And we lost our solar electric fence. Thank, Thank you. you. And we have a copy of this. We do. Okay. Uh, who would like to speak next? I'll go next. <clears throat> uh, my name is James Krasinski. And before I before I start with um, anything, uh, I just I live on 21 Church Street. Uh, I want to I know the fire department's not here if there's a member, but I want to give out some thank yous to the fire department because they came and uh, bailed me out of five feet of water in my cellar. I want to thank uh, Bill Dwight came. The mayor came, my counselor came, we had good reaction. There was a couple other city building inspectors, electrical inspectors came, and uh, it really showed great support from the city. Echoing that with all of us. <clears throat> Going forward, I have just about every problem that my neighbor had. Um, however, I had structural damage in my cellar where my cellar's cement, and I had two slabs of cement that have buckled up and right in the middle that cracked and I have silt and mud from the storm drain, from the storm water that came in. The water comes through the back of her yard, just like she said, like a river. Down the back of Yeah, I, 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 I can get into where it all starts, but I, I just wanna explain the damage that I occurred. There's no way a sump pump is gonna handle the magnitude of this kind of water. I don't care what kind of sump pump you have. I'm not an engineer or a civil engineer, but there ain't no way of sump pump. When the fire department has to stick in their eight, eight inch or 10 inch round hose, and, and it takes them four hours to get that much water out, there's no way a sump pump is gonna handle that. I know everybody has water in their cellar. I can deal with an inch of water. I can deal with a damp cellar. I can deal with, with what goes on with, with wetness. But I can't deal with five feet of water. I, I'm a city resident, I'm born in this town, I've lived in this town, I've been in my house, I think I'm the oldest resident, even though I'm not the oldest person, the oldest resident in that area, I've been there over 30 years, but it's also been my father's house and my grandfather's house, and I've been there for all the 45 years that I can remember. The situation there was never like this before. And I, and I know going into what we can do, I, I have a lot of input on that, but the city's got to act on this with urgency. This cannot be put on a back burner and we're going to, we'll try to apply for money or whatever. We have to act now. 
all our livelihood. We can't shower. We can't sell our home. Right. She's 100 percent correct. Right. We can't. We can't look at Channel 22 and say there's a thunderstorm coming. We got to be out and man the grates. And mm -hmm. I know my neighbor Steve here and me and everybody else that lives on Church Street and and because I don't go up as far as her Same. because we're manning our grates. We can't do this. We can't live like this. We can't go on vacation and call and say. Hey, did you know there was a thunderstorm here and you probably got five feet of water in your cellar? Just like my neighbor was away and found out there was five feet of, of, of water in her cellar. You can't, can't do this. The city's got to do something and they've got to do it with urgency. And um, <clears throat> I lost my snowblower. It was underwater from my garage. My, my um, lawnmower I lost. My hot water tank I lost. I had my... Um, plumber come the other day. My boiler, he says he could possibly say, but I want you to know this is my third boiler. I can't get flood insurance. I do not live in a flood zone. I've called my insurance company, King and Cushman, and I could get an insurance policy that would cost me about fifteen to eighteen hundred dollars with a maximum payout of twenty five hundred a year. And that's how it works with that. So six thousand for a boiler and i'm going to get twenty five hundred and pay fifteen hundred dollars a year in a premium it doesn't make sense so i'm caught between a rock and a hard place with my neighbors and right now this is the situation i need hot water we need to shower we need to 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 live the boiler can wait it's it's warm weather but what do i do as, this, as what do i do now do i spend six thousand dollars to know that we're gonna come into hurricane season, we're gonna come into a thunderstorm, and three weeks down the line, mm -hmm. pump me out again, call my plumber and say, hey, the electrical's all gone on the plumb on the boiler or on the hot water heater, another five grand. I can't do it. The sit this is why this is so urgent, and I and I know what I'm speaking for is I'm speaking for everybody else. And I might be forgetting, I've got a sinkhole in the back of my house now. Mm -hmm. I've got there, there's I, I can't this is all off the top of my head but it's major, major money and it's major problems right now on Church Street. The, <clears throat> the reason this is all happening, there's, there's people have different perspectives on, on what's causing this, but in different, different ways to fix it. But what's happening is, personally, like I said, I'm not a civil engineer, but the water's coming down off of Prospect Street near Glendale Road in front of I don't know if, if everybody knows where Danny Cronin used to live it's kind of like in the it's right you have the synagogue and it comes down and you have Round Hill where it comes down and all that drains right to the bottom there I know there's culverts there that move that water underneath but there's also that was so much water it was blowing sewer uh, caps and then it goes over the hill between where Danny Cronin lives and the, the other house next to it, and it flows down. Then there's a little bit of a marsh area. That marsh area fills up. There's also a little bit of a culvert that takes it to a round culvert opening. I don't know what you want to call it. That's supposed to move it out into the marsh. That's... That's ridiculous because right now it's got a beaver deceiver in there. It's a probably a three foot thing that's half full with silt. And when you have a, a river going up to it, it's going to hit it. And then what it does is it rides right along the bike track, right down to the end of Stoddard Street. The houses on the end of Stoddard Street get flooded. They're, they have a standing water pond in their backyard. And then it proceeds to hook around church, go down my neighbor's yard, into my yard, into my other neighbor's yard. And then we have like a pond, a, a moat around everybody's house. And then it just goes into the cellars because the sewers can't take it. I, I, I know that you're gonna look into this, but I strongly recommend you looking into the fact that we push this water out into that marsh where it's supposed to go. The marsh fills up and then that marsh is supposed to drain out on Barrett Street where they put in that culvert to handle that water and push it out into the Connecticut River. It's not getting there and it's coming back into the city. I know there's probably other ways to do this with other drainage and put bigger pipes in 
down by Church Street and that, but you're, you're still making that water go where that water wasn't supposed to go. <coughs> when I was a kid, and, and I know this because I was around when the, when the train ran on those tracks. I used to, my, my childhood, believe it or not, was, was stand by me if you ever watched the movie. We used to jump on the train and ride it up and get off at each one of those streets. We could ride the train because at North Fork, I mean Prospect Ave and, and Hatfield Street, the train would have to stop every 300 yards. There was a trestle down behind the, the waterworks, behind like mm -hmm. where, where Danny Cronin lived, and that trestle was a bridge where the bike, where the bike path, bike rail is now. It was open and a lot of water could go through that and into that marsh, into that area, and that marsh would fill up and then disperse out. I know the grade is not where it's gonna flow, but that was the point of it, to take that water, fill up, and then gradually go out. That trestle's not there anymore, because when they built it, they built over it and they built the, the solid wall of, 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 uh, of dirt. And then you had Stop and Shop move in. Stop and Shop created a, a problem with the buildup of uh, blacktop and the buildup of, of um, um, you know, just the construction of it so that that it higher ground it, and it pushed the water level up there. And of course the beavers, that's been a problem, but this is not the beaver issue really r right now. The issue is not letting that water get down to the end of Stoddard Street, to Church Street, to State Street, and to, to try to move that water when it's coming down off of that to either pipe it or build one of those things like they got in California, a cement well, thing. And, and James, move it, we're going to have uh, move it out. The I know that's all. About yeah, that I know that's all with the engineer. But okay. that's the issue. That's where that water's coming from, and that's what's causing our damage. And it really, really needs to be looked at, you know, with urgency, so that we can, you know, we can go ahead with our lives because this is a big, big roadblock for us right now. Yeah, it's it's so. It's helpful to hear. What it feels and like. I have a lot of pictures and that, but I think the pictures she says tells a million. So you you just be looking at more. In the Gazette. The Gazette the actually Gazette. was my house. The, yeah. the picture that was in the Gazette. Yeah. All right. Is there someone else who'd like to speak? Yes. Um, I'm right next door. Would you please introduce yourself? I'm I'm Stephen Connor. Um, I live with Karen Bellavance Grace at 19 Church Street. Um, she's been there 18 years. I've been there five. Um, I have video. And I only have video because when it floods, and it floods a lot, I get to let my dog just run free. She's a lab, and she just loves the water. So I've got video if anybody ever wants to see it. But I kept these pictures and, and videos because it was fun. But it's no fun anymore. Um, this, we do, we, when we hear that there's going to be a rainstorm, we all kind of go, okay. Who's, who's around, who's gonna do what? I run and I do the drain, and I've got video of me raking the drain mm -hmm. right in front of the house to keep the debris out so the water will keep flowing. And not a 2.8 inch event, it could be a half an inch, but the way the water travels, it just overcomes the entire system. Jim does one up on State Street, Karen does another one on State Street, I do the one on Church, these folks have gone down to the one down by King Street, and we just keep trying hope that we can keep the debris out and the water will go down. Well, this time, the water's right here. My dog's out there going, this is great, but I can't move because the water was so strong. It happens at the end of the winter with the snow melt. We have the problem. I have video of last August. I, it just goes on and on, and I don't want to repeat it, but three years ago, I lost the furnace and I went to the insurance company and I said, you know, what can I do? You're telling me you don't cover this. And they, well, if your pipes burst and the water ruins it, we'll cover it. But outside water doesn't get covered. And I'm like, okay, well, how much is it? And he said, $1,500 rider on top of what you already pay. Well, because we man the grates out there, I have avoided, I've had a foot, two feet in the basement but I've not had another five feet incident, which is what happened three years ago. Just happened again. So two furnaces in less than three years. It's kicking our butt, right? and nobody will cover it. I mean, $1,500 over those three years was 4,500. This is 3,000 plus that water 
it's almost a wash. I'm getting nowhere with it. So uh, I guess I would just say we have lost a lot of our foundation around the house. That house is an old house that stood there for a very long time. This is a new phenomenon over the last whatever years. This is not something that's always gone on. I grew up here. I used to take the train in Florence because I lived up there. <laughs> um, but it, you know, I remember as a kid when King Street had the little dip because of mm -hmm. the bridge and the road, it would fill up with water. This is not that. This is huge amounts of water that are just filling up our yards. And for the first time ever, it was up to our steps of the back porch. I was now wondering, is it going to enter the first floor? We never worried about that. We lost everything in the barn. We lost oh, some stuff in our garage. We've taken a huge hit again. It's, it is. It's When you hear thunderstorm, and I was trying to relax. I'm the veteran service officer. I had parades all weekend, all over the place. I was busy as heck. So Friday afternoon, it was going to be my quiet time to just kind of relax after a long week of preparation. And all of a sudden, I look out, and it's raining, and it's raining hard. And I texted Karen, and I said, uh, how are things there? And I get, with some expletives, it's coming in from everywhere. I race home. I can't even drive down the rest of State Street. I just park, and I run, and I start doing the great. Well, that was, you know, I ran over and shut off all the electricity. Um, I think Maureen was the one, shut down your electricity, and went, ah! But it was, it was, it, it just happens over and over again. I know this one was unique because it was so much, but it happens over and over again, and it's just so unsettling to be afraid of the rain. I mean, Karen hates the winter and hates the snow, but I always say to her, at least it doesn't come into the basement. She goes, it does when it melts. So, thanks. thanks. Is there anyone else who'd like to address this now? Yes. My name's Pam Hanna. This is my son, Gabriel. Um, we live at 11 Church Street. And um, in comparison to our neighbors, we've had, you know, such a much smaller, um, in, you know, it's impacted us much, in a much smaller way. We're the last house on Church Street closest to King. Um, and so we're... You know, we do have a damp, you know, we always have a damp basement. Um, this time, um, it was the worst that it's been. We've had one other time where we've had standing water, and we probably had, like, well, we were away, so we got a call. Um, we got a call, actually, from uh, Gabe's babysitter, who saw that King Street was flooded. Um, her sister was going to be staying at our house. She came over to our house to make sure everything was okay, um, you know, was able to get in with Maureen. Um, you know, and then they called the fire department. I mean, it was, you know, the fire department came in. Um, so when we got home on Monday and we were kind of, you know, looking in our basement, um, we, we do have a sump pump down there um, that had been put in by the previous owner. We moved in in um, July of 2008. Um, and, um, our, you know, the sump pump, everything, we run, we run a dehumidifier um, pretty much as soon as, as, as spring begins, all, you know, the, the dehumidifier runs all the time. In the winter, we heat with a wood stove, and that's why our house dries out, so we sort of dry out in the winter. Um, so there was, um, you know, puddles of, still puddles of water, and probably, there's probably like two to four inches of silt um, all along the back right near where our sump pump is. So we were starting to shovel it out. Um, and then when we walked around, we wanted to see what was going, we wanted to find um, Karen and Steve and find out, you know, what they had done with the silt. And we walk around the side of our house and there's a big sinkhole um, right on, a, a, by a window, a window well um, that was put in because of rats. Um, we also have chickens and that's sort of what we were, why we were sort of told why we saw so many rats. But now I know, I mean, you know, you've got Taco Bell, and KFC and Stop and Shop and Liquor's 44. I mean, it's a haven for everyone in the neighborhood has had rats. Um, but here they're, you know, they're thriving in the water because they can swim, right? They're not like they're gonna drown. So we had had that work done and now there's a huge sinkhole um, that we have to, you know, it's, we don't know what to do. Um, you know, what do you get, what do you get fixed? How do you dry things out? Um, you know, we plan on staying forever. We, you know, my wife and I bought the house planning that we would love for, you know, it to be in our family for generations, like, like Jim, and so we're not planning on going anywhere, but it's like, well, what do we do? 
to make sure that we're going to have you know a foundation that's going to stay. I mean, every house, almost every house on the street has a sinkhole. Yeah, and I, mean, I should if, if, I should yeah. note that right in front of our house on Church Street, it's now a sponge because there's a sinkhole under the road that's going to have to be filled. Um, I mean, well, luckily, you guys put barrels there, but you you can stand on it and go, wow, it's just blacktop. There's nothing underneath it. That's in my basement. All that soil and sand yeah. is in my basement. <laughs> or my back. Yeah. Yeah. So we just need you know needs immediate attention. Yeah. Uh, well, let's let's James, jump. Yeah, okay. Just uh, summation, okay. Terry, if I may. And, and, well, and we let uh, I think sure. everyone will recognize that this is a the last event was an extraordinary event. But the fact is, is that I think you got the sense that this is this has been a legacy for this neighborhood. Um, Fifteen years ago, Steve wasn't in the house, but his house was lifted off its foundation. Um, and of course, as we had the stormwater discussion, these extraordinary events are becoming more ordinary, which is obviously a concern. But this is this is a constant state for the folks in this neighborhood, and, and it clearly, and I, I don't think any one of you have any doubt of the, the level and sense of urgency that's being imparted here. But I and I just want to emphasize the sense of urgency. I mean, I think we we've we've tried a number of workarounds. We haven't tried anything that's been systemic and, and, and aggressive. And I think we are at the tipping point where. Um, you know, short of condemning a neighborhood mm -hmm. and seizing it by eminent domain, that the, the, the that despite because of the historic events and building and development and alterations and so on, and the re-diverting of the King Brook and everything else, all those have been formed to create a crisis that needs addressing. And and I, I and I just want to impress upon you that sense of urgency. Um, if 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 there's a punch list with priorities on it, I'd like to punch the Church Street Agnes Fox neighborhood right up to the top if if, if we have any influence on that. So that's that's all I have to say. Thank you. I think Thank you. you pretty much said it all. Yeah. I, I didn't take my name to love it. Okay. I live on 17 Church Street. I rented the house for 15 years before I purchased it. Um, so I knew about the water because during Floyd I had five feet of water in my basement. Um, it's a it's a multifamily house, it's a duplex. Um, each side is has its own separate you know utilities. Um, when I heard the river gushing through the basement, I went downstairs and there was water coming behind my electrical panel. Fortunately, it was. Put the the current um, electrical um, engineer Roger Malo uh, is the one that did the elect the electrical upgraded in my house. So he had enough insight to put the panel on a piece of plywood so that the water could run behind it. Um, I also had a gusher coming up from the floor, um, and that's I've been shoveling muck out of of that space. So. Um, I purchased the house probably 10 years ago, um, and since then I really have been only living there half time. But I have tenants living there, they're really worried every time it rains, um, they're really concerned. And you know, I feel protective of them. Um, so and luckily she had electricity, so we could I, go over to her I house that night. I had a working shower, <laughs> electricity, and a bottle of wine. So there we go. <laughs> yes. What was your name? Jane Lovett. Can I just add one thing? I won't yes. talk about all the, necessarily all the damage and everything we've and, all and talked about. Name? I'm Lou Ann Krasinski. I live at 21 Church Street. Um, I just want to say that it really has doesn't have to do with our houses or our old houses or, or really what their structure at least was. I just want to say we've been there for 35 years almost and I have never once, and I did not have cats my whole life, never once even had a mouse in my house. I mean our, our, our structure is very good but the water still comes in and even the firemen had mentioned this was the first time they ever pumped a fish out of someone's basement. So we had a fish that must have come down from the marsh. So, you know, we're just saying this is man-made, this is, you know, uh, we feel the city's um, responsibility to try to help us out in whatever way that you can. 
that's I, I won't talk about all the damage everybody else has. I'm glad you brought up the fish story. I like that. <laughs> so, so Jim Laurel, the city engineer, is going to walk us through the hydrology there and talk a little bit about sort of how we might approach this. It, it, I, let, let me say this. First of all, I think we all appreciate putting a human face to this. I mean, we, we see the picture in the paper, we read about it, but we live in different neighborhoods all over the city, and it's it really is helpful to hear what it's like to live I'm there. I'm glad that you're listening, because I'm at the point where I would love the city to buy my property. Just take it, raise the house, just take it, because unless it gets fixed, I mean, what do you do, abandon it? I, I can't keep doing this. I can't. And if you can't fix it, I would be delighted for you to take it by eminent domain. I would be delighted. I, I second that. Uh, I, once again, I, I don't want to keep reiterating, but I, I'm up to here. The water's gone over my head. And I, I've done this so much, so many years, and been involved with I, I was on the, the other committees for the uh, with yeah, the task force and all that, but this is to the point where I can't sell my house. I, I don't, and I can't live watching the watching the news for the next thunderstorm, next thunder, thunderstorm, or having a bank account that I can just throw seven, eight thousand dollars out anymore. And, and really, I, I know every one of my neighbors agree with me, yeah. and. and it just we really really like bill said this has got to be punch listed to the top the city's got to do something immediately for us because we're really caught between a rock and a hard place of where we go next and what kind of money we're going to spend and and what to do and just to be shut down by another storm and i i can't i can't live like that either the city can buy my house i don't care yeah i i, I don't want to i don't want to know where i got to shower next and, and deal with this i pay a lot of taxes in this city I, I love the city, but this is a this is a city problem. This is this is not. Um, it's certainly built up over the years. You can hear. You think about the trestle becomes solid. Yeah. The stop and shop gets built in. I mean, right. slowly the city has and over the, the years given right. permits, made adjustments, right. made changes, right. or allowed others to make changes, and they, clearly it's all becoming tangled together. Let's hear what Jim has to say. Well, I, the first thing I wanted to do is I, want, I wanted to thank uh, Maureen and uh, Pam and Rachel and Luann and Steve and Karen. They showed us, uh, Richie and I went out uh, in the morning on Tuesday to take a look around. And for the most part, the water had receded by that point. But to be able to hear from every, everyone firsthand what happened and to be able to walk around in the backyards and to, to get a better sense of what happened, um, is really important for us to understand sort of the nature of the problem, at least from this, from the most recent storm. So I want to thank everybody for that. People have been great. Um, Pam sent me a whole bunch of photos, and I've got Deb's chronology, and all of that information is really, is really useful. And I was encouraging people to come in front of the board, to, and it's great that so many people came out, right, so we can hear what's been happening over such an extended period of time. So um, I wanted to acknowledge those things, which are, which are helpful for us, and I think for everybody to understand. Um, and I can bore people with the hydrology. Um, Jim actually probably knows it better than I do because he's lived in town so long. But I think he hit on a lot of the critical aspects of what's happening with the water in, you know, in this general vicinity. So um, we printed out, this is an aerial photograph. It's a little hard to see. People know this area better than I do, but I'll just point to a couple of features. Church Street's here, King Street's here. This is the bike path. Um, the Barrett Street Marsh is here. Um, so after we walked around, R Rich Parsley, the highway superintendent, and I have been walking around the last couple of days, um, Tuesday and Wednesday, a couple of times on different occasions to take a look at um, the damage and try to get a sense of what's happening. And it seems, I think all the, all the critical points um, Jim had pointed out earlier, but there's a, there's a large uh, box culvert that goes under the bike path sort of in this vicinity in the back of the stop and shop building. There's a there's a, a brook that he described very well that comes down this hill that leads to this uh, leads to the box culvert. 
Um, there was a, a beaver dam there and a beaver deceiver, I think what she saw. Um, if you look further up, as he had described, I'll throw out a, a few um, numbers here because people expect the city engineer to throw numbers out probably. But um, there's a number of pipes from the Round Hill area. So the whole Round Hill neighborhood, right, comes down in this area and crosses Prospect Street and then goes down this relatively steep channel to that box culvert that I talked about. These are pretty big pipes up coming off of Round Hill, right? There's a 24 inch pipe coming down Prospect Street. There's another 12 inch pipe on Prospect Street. There's a 36 inch pipe coming down Glendale Avenue. There's a cross country line that's 30 inches in diameter. Tons of water coming off that hill in very steep, steep type of circumstances that discharge here. And as far as we can tell <coughs> in, this, in this last storm, which granted was a very, very intense storm, right? So um, under that type of circumstance, there might have been, there was a lot, there was damage across the city, but this was really, really bad from what we could see. It's at Church Street and State Street and, and recurrent, right? And that's what people keep saying. Steve's like, every time, every time there's a shower, you know, you're out there cleaning out the catch basin, right? So in this case, anyway, because there was a, uh, there's some debris and obstruction in this channel. A lot of water uh, was coming down here and got diverted by the obstruction in the channel. Kind of went across through here to the um, cross country and, and ran along the bike path right to State and Stoddard Street. Goes through all the backyards as he described. Some of it comes around the Church Street and then this whole area is like a swimming pool. Um, so we were taking a look at that. A lot of the debris and things that are in the channel we removed uh, this morning so that that will flow a lot better because, you know, I'm hearing what people are saying. Now, I don't even live in this area. I live in Florence at a higher elevation, but I saw the forecast and it was for thunderstorms yesterday. Yeah. I'm like, all right, well, you know, what are we going to do for these people if we get another intense rainstorm? And it's like the next day I just met with Maureen. She was just running us around, taking a look at everything. So. We're doing everything that we can. I think there's probably a bunch of steps that can be taken. Keeping this drainage channel clear of all the drainage that comes down Round Hill Road is critical, right? We gotta get this water, like he was saying, he could have my job, he can have my paycheck for today. The water that goes under the bike path, that's gotta get under there. I mean, we can't have situations where we've got things that are diverting flow in the stream. Can't have it. We just cannot have it. <coughs> And then there is a lot of, um, there's some sediment in this culvert that needs to be cleaned out. Richie and I are working on a plan um, to, to try to get all the sediment cleaned out of there so that that path for the flow <coughs> down here uh, is as clean and uh, as capable of carrying as much water as possible. Because our goal is to get as much water as we can through here so it doesn't somehow get diverted down here. It's like a tidal wave. I wasn't, I didn't see this particular storm but I've seen other storms down there and it's a frightening thing and I don't even live there. So, you know, I can't imagine what, what these folks have to put up with. And um, so we My do- My dog's the only one who we, likes it. We do, <laughs> un, you know, it, I think we understand how critical it is. And I did say to one person that I will not rest until we have a plan that's gonna work for these people so that they don't have to look at the forecast every, every day saying, oh man, you know, what is gonna happen tonight? Jim, can I ask you just um, a, a little bit of a clarification or whatever, when you're talking about this, I'm, I'm assuming that you have a lot more planned than that because, um, you know, we've, we've gone through everything that you just said. We've had the culvert cleaned out this before the beavers. We've had, you know, the, the, the school Saturday. there sure. uh, cleaned out and everything. Yeah. But what, what seems to have happened also is since it, it does get plugged up, it the water kind of has a mind of its own. It prefers not to go through there anyway. So even when you do clean it out, um, which it needs a, a lot more than once every ten or fifteen years, but it's um, developed its it, own. Yeah, channel. it's got its so, own channel. So even yep. if you do everything you say, you just said just now, yep. I'm not sure it's going to go where you want it to go. So I'm not. I wasn't quite I'm done. I'm sure you weren't. But, but I, I but I but I appreciate that, right? I mean, you've I'm seen this. Sure. You've seen it for years, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the first, I mean, this is what we could do today, right? right. So, um, you know, we were trying to make this a better drainage channel. We're trying to keep this open. We're reviewing what's happening in this marsh in terms of hydrology. If you've been out there, it's a series of beaver dams. 
There's uh, if you go all the way up to Barrett Street, there's a series of ponds out here. Mm -hmm. We were going to get water surface elevations to, to determine better how how this system's functioning. There's beaver dam activity right on the other side of the culvert, right here. If you've taken a peek over in the back there, right, you've seen that. Yeah. We did some work today to drop that down to try to get the water level lower at, at the outlet where this pipe comes out. But these are just like the little things that we can do today. It may not have prevented, it would have helped probably, I think, the storm that we had. It may not have prevented damage. It's really impossible to say. That was a lot of water. But those are, the, those are some of the things that we can do immediately. Some of the other things which people have already started to do, people are e emailing me copies of the CDM report and information that was in there um, that looked at drainage deficiencies along King Street. And if you look along Church Street, State, and Stoddard Street, all these drain lines, um, so if you come down Stoddard, it's a 12-inch line, State Street's a 12-inch line, Church Street's an 18-inch line, and people have seen this, the only functional catch basin is the one that you're cleaning, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the only catch basin in Church Street. And it seems like these lines on State and Stoddard that are 12 inch are too small really, really to handle any flow. You probably see this, right? You get a little bit of a rainstorm. Are they functional? No, they can work. They don't work, right? Well, I mean, we have a storm drain right in the middle of my garden as well, but that fills up so fast from the yards. So right. right. That's not part of the system. Yeah, that's, that's the old. That's antiquated, yeah. 150 years, the, the thing that you but opened up. But that's so probably the thing that I opened up. Right, right. Yeah. right. That's, old, that's, that's a, a separate story. A so some of the things, so, so I've only been looking at this for like, since I met with, with Maureen the other morning. But the things that jump out, what could, what could we do immediately? Could we put, you know, install the catch basins on Church Street that would be more functional because this line at least seems to have some capacity? I don't know, that was something that we would look at. Um, the CDM report had, had recommended, um, so CDM was a consulting firm, looked at drainage defici deficiencies across the city. They made some preliminary recommendations in this part of town, um, Church Street, State started King Street, um, and things, uh, and looked at the drainage capacity in that area. They had recommended along the end of State Street here for that line to be a 24 inch line. They looked at, um, they recommended that Church Street be a 36 inch line which is a lot bigger than what's there now, twice yeah. the size. Um, and then uh, all the way down, once you get up to King Street, they were recommending uh, lines be upsized all the way down King Street. So if we're gonna put bigger, if we're gonna put bigger drainage pipes in here, we, need to, we would need to look at what the repercussions of that are. But we have some money with the stormwater utility at some place now to start doing some of these things that would have been nearly impossible for us to do last year. Um, so we're looking at sort of operational and maintenance things that will make what we have more functional and stay on top of that. And then we're also looking at um, other capital projects that would take would take longer time to design and permit and, and to construct. So um, that's pretty much what I've come up with in you know in a in a couple of days. But um, suffice to say it's it's great to hear from people and to and to see the urgency and um, you know we're gonna keep working on things to try to make it better. I don't really have, you know, there's no magic bullet. So how do we find out what the next steps are? I What's your name? Sarah Peters, 279 State Street. Okay. I can reiterate and validate everything that I've <coughs> talked about. Yeah. Um, I bought the house in 2007 and eight months later had to replace the furnace. I didn't realize that this water problem was never disclosed. Um, and I appreciate that you've completed all of this work in a very short amount of time. And I wonder how we can move this project or these upgrades to the top of the priority list because this is um, let, let me if i could address that and this is not uh cheery happy-go-lucky news i'm afraid uh cdm identified we asked them to look at four projects around the city just so we got some sense of scale and one of the projects we asked them to look at was this whole north uh, uh, this whole king street drainage area and they came back with a number on the order of $19 million. Uh, we have a new stormwater fee, which everyone at this table is really thrilled about. But politically, in order to get that through, we agreed that it would not exceed $2 million per year. So if we took all of the money we're going to raise for the next 10 years and spent it on nothing but this project, we could afford to do it. I, and obviously that's not practical and that's not going to happen it can't happen the scale of this drainage issue is as Jim mentioned big pipes have to go into other even larger pipes uh, and 
we have chronic problems. You've seen the underpass over to North Street flood every time there's a decent rainstorm. The problem is everything coming down King Street from the Potpourri Mall down south is going into small pipes. Um, it, it, this is going to be a tough one to solve, and certainly it's going to be difficult to solve in the, you know, in the in the span of 18 months, 24 months. So, what do you recommend? Is I what mean, is eminent domain an option? It's, it's to, be, to be frank, probably not. Yeah, that but would certainly that would be a political. Yeah. But so so what I can say within this department, within this board, as Jim said, we hear you. This, we get it, and, and I have to confess, I didn't get it. I wasn't, you know, a couple of pictures of flooding occasionally didn't strike me the, the way hearing your stories, uh, with the same impact that hearing your stories has. But it isn't, on the other hand, a, a, something that we can solve by next summer. Uh, what Jim is talking about, uh, specific maintenance, getting busy to make sure that that whole uh, Barrett Street swamp is flowing as best we can make it toward the north. Is that's what we can do this summer? That's and that might be the extent of what we can do. Excuse uh, me, to Terry. To, um, I think you know what's being described. Of course, is is interim interdiction for uh, trying to keep you safer, but without the guarantee. For instance, under the extraordinary event, the last one probably wouldn't be as severe, but th that's not to say that your basins will be dry. But I think also a comprehensive plan with emergency response systems like the fire department, uh, anticipating, you know, we all, I got the EMS buzz on, the, uh, I mean, the emergency broadcast buzz as it was just about to start raining. I understand that you guys don't get any alerts any sooner than that, but if the, the fire department can understand because the fire department was broadcast all over the city in this particular event, but usually in any storm or rain event, not everyone is living in complete abject trepidation like this neighborhood is. And if we can set up some protocols for other departments' responses, sandbags, pumps, uh, diversion, having rather than having the neighborhood go out with rakes and getting soaking wet, or and, sandbags, or sandbags, mm -hmm. but we're keeping the storm drains clear. There's actually there's a there's actually a network of like seven or eight storm drains right at the end of Stoddard or that is, it starts to run down church. Mm -hmm. And what these poor folks have to do is once it's already flooded, they have to try and locate it as they're soaking wet and digging out leaves and branches. Also, this and, and to Jim's point about the capacity, I think the point that proves that, that the capacity of that pipe that's running down church is certainly not adequate is I saw Steve clearing that storm drain but it ultimately didn't matter. There was no draw on it. Right, right. It was already over capacity, and the and the street just took the place of whatever the storm drain with, with that that pipe couldn't handle. I mean, so anything that we can do to try and reduce it as the events occurring too, and try to mitigate, it's not a panacea. I don't. I mean, and I think this is always a frustration of these type of meetings, is to tell folks quite frankly that there is there is no magical transition. But the fact is, is that that we're obliged to address it as promptly and most efficiently as we can to try and, and, and at the very least reduce your strain. Yeah, well, I mean, we I, never, and I don't know about anybody else, but nobody raised the issue of health issues. And was, that's, I think the BOH should be involved in this. I think, I think um, fire department, the police are certainly were, but they're mostly good at, that's, they don't get wet often on these things, but, the, but you're right, the Department of Health relative to vermin, um, storm drains being overwhelmed, uh, sewers and uh, the sewage that comes from households is being overwhelmed by uh, storm drain systems. These guys are all well, aware of that. Well, the mosquitoes, the vermin, the respiratory issues. Right. I mean, Those are all legitimate and, and genuine concerns that we have to address holistically, and I hope that we do. And this is well, and maybe and maybe suspending our taxes for a period of time. I mean, my property has no value. It has an assessed value on paper, but I couldn't give my property away. I couldn't give it away. Unless you look at the lakefront. Bill, I think one of the things that we're trying to do here is come up with a plan that will make things better. There are things in the CDM report that would result in sort of the perfect engineering solution that would be a very, very big project. But I would be happy if there were 
if there was water that was pooling in the street that didn't go above the curb line and then into everybody's backyards. So there's sort of different levels of things that you can do. And some of those answers that are the big ones will not be the places that we're going to start, right? I think we're going to look at things that we could do that would make it better. Like you would need your boots if you were walking down the street, but you wouldn't need a pump to get four feet of water out of your basement. Well, and so, Ned and I have talked numerous times, and he's been down, I mean, like the bank, my, because my, our driveway is the river. Our driveway becomes the river for all these yards, in, in addition to the street. And we've talked about berming up the tree, you know, the treeway and the driveways. The driveways on State Street that are very high do not have the water problem. There are actually houses in the same neighborhood right. that don't have the problem. Right. And I think it's worth looking at why don't they, can you I, know? Can I just say one thing? Yes. I, I totally agree with what Jim was saying about the pipe system and everything, but it, like I said, I'm not an engineer, but this is, it's just common sense that our main problem is, is the river. If the river wasn't there, the storm drains could handle a regular rainstorm. It's this <coughs> massive flow yeah. of water. You're getting round hills also. Exactly. If this water, if you could stop this river, which never existed before, and push this water out into that marsh, we wouldn't even need the re, the the thirty inch pipes, the, the uh, retaining walls, or retaining walls, or anything. Our problem is the river. Even though long term, I totally agree because because that's a hundred year old piping system. It needs to be done, but we have to we have to just use common sense and say where's our issue, and our issue is the river. How can we stop that flow and push it out into that marsh? So we can fill the marsh and then drain out the way it's supposed to out to the Connecticut River through Barrett Street right. and not come down Stoddard and Church Street. Yeah, I mean, yeah, putting big pipes in to stop a river that's going down into your neighborhood that should be going across the bike path is not where we want to be. Right. I would agree. So maybe I would, something I would like agree. a retaining wall I would agree. or, a, or Which, a dam or something like that. Yeah. that well, it should also be noted the outlet on the Barrett Street side is often overwhelmed. And the same storm event you'll see that 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 mm -hmm. the, it frequently flows over the road. The water doesn't disappear. It uh, water like so many things just follows its own course. And what we try to do is wrestle with it. So there are consequences. It's like diverting traffic. And if we divert the water, we increase the capacity for the marsh. The marsh doesn't have the capacity. The outlet doesn't have the capacity, and so on. So it is a systemic. It has to be addressed systemically mm -hmm. and with an infusion of bonded money and lots of money. And I think, I mean, I think this is a, a multi-tiered approach that we're talking about and I think that you're hearing being presented is that immediate mitigation to try and offset the, the really, the worst impacts that you guys have been experiencing so that you're not replacing furnaces on a, on a biannual basis. And then um, working up to and bonding hopefully and getting the money to actually uh, do a major project that's this is why we actually push for the, the stormwater fee because we we have these issues all over the city but you guys that's why I was calling for the getting pushed up the top of the list because many people are ankle deep in water you guys are knee deep in water and I think the the level of urgency is that but I I don't want I don't want to suggest to people that there is a magic solution. The city will come and seize your property by eminent domain and raise the neighborhood. Personally, I wouldn't like to see the loss of that neighborhood. That neighborhood. I don't either. It's we a, love. We love it. Of course you do. We and, love and, and, that. And, and, and I grew up in Southampton. I didn't know that part of State Street existed. <laughs> right. You know, it's a I love place. it. It's I a think people place. also. I just. I think people need. People are, are replacing mechanicals. We know about that. We know we have an understanding of what the cost of that is. My big fear is most of us have have foundation problems now. And for the foundation mm -hmm. problems, I mean, we're talking tens, twenty, thirty thousand dollars. I was yeah, quoted thirty I was quoted like, thirty thousand dollars from my basement for the crack that that was a result of, of the storm damage. So I mean what I'm saying is if I invest thirty thousand dollars into fix because it's and it has to come out of my pocket because there's no there uh, is no insurance. If I do that and repair my foundation and then in a year I get 
another crack in it. So we're, we're, we're really kind of freaked out about that kind of thing. Like, mm -hmm. how, where, what do we repair? Or, or right. the other option is, do we all just, as Deb suggested, abandon the properties and let you know? I mean, we don't. We need some. We need some help. And I know I'm the. I'm supposed to be the person giving guidance yeah. right here now. But no, I'm Maureen, what, what's our move here? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let, let's see if we can wrap this up for this evening. Bill, I think you you had some great points about this being a multidisciplinary solution. Whatever it is, the Board of Health, the rats, mm -hmm. the mosquitoes, the vermin. Um, the building department is involved, certainly. Um, is there some place, would that be the mayor's office that would be coordinating that? I think the mayor's, I mean, you know, emergency, we have an emergency, uh, a mm -hmm. systemic emergency response system here in the city, and, and somehow if we can, and I don't know if this is actually protocol, but I think it should be an aspect of protocol for emergency response, that this is a group that includes fire department, police department, board of health, building commissioner, all public safety systems. And if there is a system that allows for an anticipated storm, and, and with weather projections, you can get a pretty good sense of how this neighborhood is going to be impacted. With the ongoing maintenance of the existing system that wheezes, but it's, it'd be better that it's not clogged, and then with coordinated efforts from the fire department being able to dispatch in a timely manner to set up sandbags if they could, or, or the Department of Public Works uh, having um, some folks come in and start sandbagging. Fire department ready to pump, do uh, prophylactic pumping, you know, as opposed to reactive pumping. Um, and the Board of Health coming in just to make sure that there's not fish in people's basements and that there's not, uh, you know, and there's not raw sewage breach or anything like that. All those things, just so that this, I think what's important is that these folks, I mean, what you hear is this level of stress as to whether they can continue to live in these places. And I think if we uh, coordinate and give them some sense of assurance that there aren't going to be unicorns grazing on their lawn, but at the same time, there won't be fish in their basement, and that whatever we can do to reduce the level of stress as we look forward to uh, an ultimate answer with the, the major engineering process. So would there be a... So it sounds like someone would have to convene a meeting, a multi, right. a cross, uh, multidisciplinary well, there is meeting. Such a committee that exists, the chief of police and the fire chief are basically in charge of it. So I think it'd be, it'd be something worth referring to. That. So and, and more they, maybe that would be to push for. I mean, obviously you need a, a meeting to put together the, uh, the specifics of a plan for this neighborhood. We it's, we need more than just the fact that this committee exists. We have to get them to meet and talk about this specific issue, and it would be crossed. It I'm sure. Jim would be involved, Ned would be involved. And, and then as far as our work, for the immediate future, next you know, month, three months, meticulously maintaining that little marsh on, on the south side of the rail trail, taking a look at the uh, entrance on the marsh side, yep. where the beaver activity right. is. Yep. How about anything beyond that in terms of putting some meat on the bone as far as what might be the small bites we could take begin taking out of this problem in the near future we're working on it right now and we'll keep working on it i mean it's the immediate things that we can do operationally i've been focused on with rich the last couple of days to figure out what can we do right now because we know anything else could take months or a year or more to do but making the system better and more functional that we have today is going to be a big help, right? So that's what we're, that's where the energy has been spent the last couple of days. But we're going to continue to keep working on looking at other things that we can do, whether it's putting a couple of catch basins on Church Street or trying to get other larger segments of pipe in or looking at, you know, I mentioned the hydrology and Barrett Street and what's happening to see if this water, you know, the elevated water elevations in the Barrett Street marsh because of the beavers, whether that's causing a problem. We're going to try to look at all of these things. There's a bunch of things to look at, and we can look at everything in two days. But. So if Councillor Carney checked back in three months, is well, that? Oh, no. We're coming into storm season, typhoon season right. in the next month. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking for some sense of when we should revisit this issue. I mean, can I make, I mean, I think we need to convene, like Bill's talking about, like convene an emergency crew so that the next storm, 
we know where we're going to be putting sandbags and we're going to, I mean, you know, maybe it makes sense to try and like sandbag on State Street on your driveway right now in Sarah's so, yard. So, to, to limit the river that's going to then yeah. flow. Pa yeah. Pam, I'm, I'm talking about parallel things. I think that meeting, uh, I'll, I think your city council is going to be on that issue right away, the getting together that multidisciplinary mm -hmm. group. I'm talking about from an engineering perspective, mm -hmm. when can we come, come to, when can the other put land? as far as what we might be able to do. When can in, we put in a bigger pipe, I think is... Well, the, the bigger pipe right is, we don't need that's to meet in three months, that's more than three months. But I'm is looking it three for years? the that's small... Just, you know, is it three years? I think that's just helpful to know. Is it, if we know it's not three months, is it three years? That's a huge I mean, project. Is it three years? years well, you years. said 10 years. For 10 it years. was a 19 if we million took, dollar. If we took the, the entire yeah. stormwater budget, every yeah. dollar, yeah, I know. for 10 yeah. years, yeah. That's, that's the big thing. So money has that's come not, from that's not, the cost, that's not the cost of this project. The, co the cost of the whole... The whole, whole, that that whole King Street. Street drainage system. Just the King is, Street project. As recommended by CDA. Ours yeah. and King Street. Now, we haven't put that out to bid or anything. That was an estimate. Yeah. Right. But that's to get the 36 inch pipe, for example, on Church Street to flow into a 48 inch pipe, which eventually goes to a, you know, it has to, it says it collects more and more water, the pipes right. have to get larger and larger. Right. It's 19 million to do the King Street? To that do the was King the Street number pipe. they threw out. Okay. Uh, so it was not a guesstimate, but it wasn't an accurate engine. You know, it's not like we put that out okay. to bid. Right. Dang, that's going to be a lot of Can I just, yeah. I just, I just want to make one more um, comment because sure. I know you're going to be wrapping up soon. and. Um, I had a lot of hope, and obviously, you know, we're disappointed with what we're hearing today. Um, I just want to say everything you say you're going to, most of what you say you're going to do was already promised, done, or whatever. You're saying you're going to maintain it more meticulously, yeah, but um, basically it's been done and, and it really isn't helping. And my feeling now, <coughs> trying not to be really bitter, is I just feel that this is a, a, a problem that was made by the city of Northampton. And I want the city of Northampton to at least hear my voice to say that I want them to take responsibility for it. And what, when I see that I have to buy a new furnace or fix my foundation or whatever, I say the city of Northampton did this to me because we've allowed the building to happen, we've allowed all these things to happen. Progress happens without maintaining and using common sense and doing the right stuff at the right time. And so I feel like a victim and I feel like it's the city of Northampton that's done it to me. And it brings me thinking about um, the Glendale landfill when the people had homes there that they purchased. And we purchased our house when it was dry. They purchased it with smelly, with, with smells and the city bought it, their houses from them. And for more than they were worth, and I'm at that point where that's what I feel the city owes me. Terry. And I know it sounds bitter, but I just needed that one little piece to get out. I'm sorry. That's okay. If, completely, un say is completely, un completely understandable. We need to look at answers. I don't think that every possible solution was in that CDM report. And what I want to leave people thinking tonight is that we're going to look at answers and alternatives to try to make things better. And so I don't, I'm asking, it's, it's, it's... And I don't know the schedule. I'll be in contact with okay. Maureen regularly. I'm not going to tell you it's going to be next week. It might be two weeks, but I can let you know the progress that we're making. I haven't laid out a schedule. I'm not going to make one up here. Okay. I don't really know how long it's going to take. But we're going to look at options and things that might be more affordable or maybe a multi-year plan. If we know a $19 million job is never going to come, that's not going to be the first thing I'm going to look at to try to make things better in your neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. give us a little bit of a chance to see what we can come up with solutions. We're gonna do our best. I appreciate checking the forecast and, and you know, I, I'm, I'm hearing these things, right? So we'll work on things the best that we can. We'll come up with some alternatives. We'll look at pricing. We'll look at schedule for different things. Bill had some great ideas. I've already been talking to Richie about sandbags and making clean sand available and sandbags for people. And maybe that's part of an overall more proactive response plan in the interim that that might lend some help i don't really know but we're happy to, to to work with emergency services on that but that's the best i don't want people to go away without hope is there I mean, anything the city can do to help us where we are right now to fix anything or is everything our own responsibility 
you, whether you it's the foundation it. fee having to be fixed or sinkholes filled or um, uh, furnaces being replaced, et cetera. I'm not going to blow smoke. I don't think so. I think what's, I mean, you can sue. Yeah, I, uh, I spoke to an attorney yeah. about a class action suit. You, Joe you Wilhelm, can, you, for you, anybody who knows Joe, right. who lives on Round Hill. Right. It's <laughs> causing this. It's a public meeting. We don't want to out Joe. Yeah. <laughs> the, but, and, you know, I'm not going to encourage or discourage you in that, but um, personally, I hope. Um, as counselors, we don't want to fail you anymore. But I don't think I, I I wouldn't put a lot of stock in that too. I understand the desperation that drives you here. I mean, you know, from my conversation with you guys 15 years ago. I know it's just and it's cheaper than 19 million to mm -hmm. pay for my furnace every two years. No, no, years, absolutely. Five years if you want I don't to. think you're going to find a single person who can argue with you on that. And that's, I, 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 it, it's. You know, trying to determine culpability and so on, you know, cumulative culpability would be very difficult to make, uh, you know, because historically that was also the path of the King Brook. So mm -hmm. someone would argue that building down there was, and rerouting the brook was a bad idea, well, those many years ago. It's, it's an historic influence, and so what I'd prefer to do is move from today, despite the fact that you guys have endured a lot of suffering, but to progress from this point. Right. So and I don't want to. I don't want to say. I don't want to say that I. I want to sue the city or anything. It's this helplessness. Exactly. You of absolutely. Just the feeling. This is. This is the frustration that that. I don't. Huh? I'm not made of money. Here. No, no, no. That you are in a horrible, horrible <laughs> circumstance. It's. It's. There's. And you won't get. I. 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 I, I don't think anyone can even reasonably argue that. And to the extent that, you know, I, I wish I could offer you salvation and, and suddenly make it work. I really do. Then I could get a vote or two. But, I think, but the fact is, is that I think we have to look at this realistically and how we're going to approach this realistically. And, the, and my, I think my biggest motivation right now is to make sure you guys don't have to live in dread and poverty and hate your houses. Oh, I love my house. Still. I know. It's okay. spite we, of all of this. We have a skylight, so when it rains heavy, I don't care if it's 2 a.m., 4 a.m., I hear it and I start looking out into the street. So I will be on duty. Well, that's, and, and, and I, think, I think the, the, what I, if we can get a, a team together that can respond based on rain to show up and then, as I said, start working on clearing those storm drains, they keep up with set, uh, the, the sediment. Buildups. I, I saw that Rich had the street swept there for the siltification issues that usually build up off that brook off on Lawn Avenue. The the siltification is some of the stuff that you guys are seeing clogging. So they're blowing out the culverts. Um, and and when's right? I mean, this has been promised for a long time to keep this on a maintenance schedule. But th there are a lot of mitigating issues, not the least of which is not a whole lot of money. And also. Let's not discount the fact that, that these extraordinary storm events are becoming more ordinary. We are, the reason there was the pressure for the stormwater and flood control issue was the fact that maybe there are some folks who don't believe that climate change has occurred, but at point in fact, at least it's manifesting here. If you look at it historically, we are seeing higher volume rains with more pressure. And the state and federal government has, has suggested to us we may want to tune up our umbrellas and um, as such, and of course they didn't know money came with that. So as such, this is we've got we've got to work with what we've got here just to make sure you guys get to be okay. So I apologize, I have to run to another meeting. I got to go to that meeting thank too. You. <laughs> thank you all for listening. To if I so may, much Jerry, for coming um, in. Uh, we had a member of the reuse committee made some cookies to spread some love in, and I think the people in this Me? room yeah. <laughs> need to. So I'm going to take them from you guys, and I'm going to give them to the people who. Have <laughs> can, can I just Stop ask? I, don't, I have a, one question that I don't know if it should be directed to Ned or to you, Jim. Um, but it, and I know it was just brought up. Is there anything the city can do? Um, is there anything the that universe. the city can do as far as uh, letting us come and take some uh, sand or gravel or, or, or uh, yeah. off the back here in the back lots? 
to now, fill it. Now, previously, in. the sand was salted, yeah, mixed. and that's why I couldn't use the sand from the city. We'll, 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 we'll get sand. We get sand. We'll get sand. You'll get you sand. To, to, fill it, to, to, fill it to fill in our sinkholes. That's what I'm. That, that's the question. Gravel or or, or or top. You know, we also got deep holes from. At least I do from the fire trucks. Um, because the ground was so saturated that when they backed in, I mean, just could, 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 could And I, I just want to say, if anyone ever seen Jim mm -hmm. and Lance's backyard, I mean, neat and tidy. You know, yeah. like I mean, it's yeah. spotless. But uh, it, it, as far as that, is there any way? Is there any city yard? We don't have. We we can get materials and bring them here or deliver them down there. You okay. can. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, it's not. I I need probably a quarter of a yard, but mm -hmm. I mean. Just to fill in, it would help. It would help. <coughs> so coord coordinate that with oh. Ned. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The driveway. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Your oh yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That would be. So I can call fabulous. you Ned or, or yeah. Or, no, me. Okay. Be fine. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. For then we have to hold on the street that yeah. you want to. Thank you for listening. Yeah. So a car doesn't go. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, guys. The rest of the committee, thank you. Oh, there you go. Good. I'm glad I wasn't the only one taking care of these. Yeah. Yeah. You were doing that. Yeah. 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 Is that your estimate? Did you come up with that number? I'm taking two. Oh, the solution is fun here. Did we, did we do 4B? Yeah, no, don't we have to talk about I've had those in my office all day. All right, go ahead. Did we get a second on that? They brought cookies. How about a second on second. taking the reuse proposal? I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. Second. All in favor of taking Aye. out of order? Aye. Excellent. Well, now that it's appropriate, it's lighting back down. If any of you saw our group resume, you could see we have some important skills, and we marshaled our formidable uh, persuasion persuasion powers and decided to bring you cookies. <laughs> Thank you. So we we all have seen a copy You've of your report. You've all seen a copy. I brought I brought extras in case anyone oh, did not oh. have it. Absolutely. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. No. I'll go for it. I made black and white one. So I think this was the major thing that. Uh, people had questions about last time was what would need to happen and how it could happen, etc. So we prepared this. Ned, do you have anything to add? Um, just a call Dave Palmer and said they had back from him. I would need the building permit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in your meeting, when you all went to Glendover and met with Central Services, uh, was there a Central Services will now have to get back to you about this. They're going to look at some of the things. They had some uh, old lighting that they thought they could reuse for free, potentially, mm -hmm. for the project. Yeah. Um, they comment, so we have need to check in with the building permit and mm -hmm. electrical permits, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most difficult things is who's going to sign off on the project at the end of the day, mm -hmm. whether it's an architect or an engineer or a construction uh, license supervisor of some sort we'll have there, there might be happy to be, you might be able to get a waiver for it which is unknown okay. that's a decision that uh, Louis Hasbrook would have to make on that so that was I think one of probably the one of the biggest blocks was who's going to sign off on this thing at the end of the day right as constructed to code and so on so so it needs to go to Louis Hasbrook first and also get feedback from central services 
And the essential right. services is there. The yeah. impression I got from them, they're more than willing to do the work. It's a matter of what exactly do we want to have done oh, okay. and getting it done. And what time frame that's going to be in. Okay. Right now, their big push right now, now the school's out, or going to be out in another month, is to work on the schools while all the students are gone. Mm -hmm. That's usually their big summer push. So are we overreaching? I mean, if, if we... I haven't seen the building, but you've got a bunch of plywood walls. If you had decent lighting and if it, were, if it was lockable, do we need walls? Do we need to turn this into a major building project just to get going? Number one is I think you have to do some kind of protection right there. It's, it's pretty rough inside. I mean, number one is the back wall has to come down itself. It has to be reframed internally because of the condition that it's in. The front wall actually, um, one of them is a uh, sliding door, a garage door that's completely off and broken. And so they're looking at reframing the front of that too. As far as the, the uh, east wall and the west wall are, appear to be in pretty good shape. So it's really the front and back. And they're trying to make it you know, somewhat vermin proof so that you don't have birds flying in through the ceilings, through the rafters, things of that nature. Mm -hmm which some services gave the impression that all it takes is to you know, rip some plywood and nail it up there and just kind of secure it from the elements. Oh, right now it's only scheduled to be open three, or, um, three seasons a year. Right. It's not scheduled mm -hmm. to be open in the winter, it's mm -hmm. my understanding at this point. I asked, I asked David Pomerantz what, if we had skilled people working, doing the work, how long would it take them? And he said, I believe he's just said a day or two. So it's 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 rel it seemed like they thought it was relatively simple. I'm looking at you to to, to I'm confirm because I'm not a building person. Things. Yeah, Except I mean sewer lines. they seem to think it was fairly simple that yeah. that the tear out piece and the framing piece would take a little while, and it's possible that we could get some volunteers to do some of that. Mm -hmm. um, but you know they said if you had a skilled group, you know a couple of people here, they could do it in a day or so. So it's not like it's you know weeks worth of work. That was hopeful to me. <laughs> so you had a good list of important steps. I'm wondering if they were in sequential order. I kind of put them in potentially sequential order, but they certainly can be massaged. Okay. I, I just kind of put them in logical right. order. So I'm just trying to think about like what the next step is to hear back from the building inspector so that's our first thing to hear back from. Mm -hmm. Is that, and Ned, Ned is, is um, You need a building permit to do anything. Right, exactly. And that's going to tell us a lot. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so is that a conversation or is that filling out the building permit? I mean, if. Uh, it, it's actually it getting the application, coming up with a plan to submit to Louis so that okay. he can review and approve it. Okay. And they, they couldn't hire a contractor. It has to be done by central services. Once you, once you get into chapter 149, touching a public building from dollar one, okay. you're talking prevailing a year, wage. two years, prevailing wage rates. It's, we're trying to do it as much as we can on okay. the cheap internal to the city so we don't have to go that route. Ned, was there some, I thought there was some question as to whether we would even need a plan, that, that it wasn't certain that we would need, right. we need an application, we need but an we application. didn't know if we also needed a plan. It all depends on the details that Louis is going to require. And uh, Dave Pomerantz has to arrange for that meeting. They, they can't ask the Louis directly. I'm just trying to figure out, it's a, a, it's a little bit of a variation on what Roe is asking. I'm just trying to figure out how to get a little unstuck here. I think it has to come through some form of uniformity. It's going to come through central services or through the department, or a point person from the department, which could be me, or I could find someone to do in the department. But it has to be consistent, I think. It can't be just all over the map and changing every time we want to do something. Right. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Now, would that be, I mean, would the, po the point person be someone that you would appoint or Susan would find? Well, I was hoping the central service director would take that over because it's oh. going to be mostly his manpower, I think, okay. actually doing the electrical work and the, probably some of the framing work. But okay. I put in a call to David, I didn't hear back. 
Okay, so you have the phone call in, which is the next yeah, step. Yeah, well, that's a step, start. Yeah, right. But he's, not, uh, but he's not gonna be, I mean, I think it's valuable if you or someone you designate stays involved because the central services director, this is not his baby, it's not his project. He, I mean, I'm sure he'd be happy to be helpful, but. He would be. It's someone so someone in our in need. organization mm -hmm. has to be involved also, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Yes. So, well, I'm just, I'm just, yeah. So we're right at the point about um, you have a call in to him. Are you going to be the point person, or is I can start off being and see okay. where it flows from there. Okay. If Dave Pomerantz and his group, well, Warren Jones and others, are willing to spearhead, mm -hmm. more than happy to let them move forward with it because they're doing all the work. Okay. Couple of questions. Has anybody done a cost-benefit ratio on this? How much are we going to recycle? What's it going to cost us? Where's the money going to come from? Since we're playing this interdepartmental compensation thing now, is the enterprise fund going to pay central services for their time? Not and, sure. Oh, that'll be and, I mean, into. we don't know yet. And has anybody ever looked into the Hadley method of reuse, which is put it on the curb? We have a curb day once a month. Instead of having a building and all the rigmarole that's going to go with this, I know when I have property in Hadley, if I want to get rid of something, it's on the curb for two days and gone. We're. I, I think we. I, I think it's fair to say we have somewhat more ambitious plans than that. Um, and there are a lot of people with some really good energy who want to work on this. Yeah, but the, the other questions we don't have answers for. Right? All right, I mean, we got to look at the money. That's where's where's the money coming from? Thank you. So, our point person mm -hmm. is going to talk to Dave Pomeranz. That's mm -hmm. correct. And um, I I think the group is going to need some help knowing when to reconvene with more cookies. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do want to say I think these pictures and this list is is wonderful, and really I think that yeah, to really that right, exactly. And so we know where we're going for the next step. Is that enough of a response for for you all? Well, yes. it uh, moves along, and I would like to address, yes, this is much bigger <clears throat> than just getting rid of old junk. I mean, I see it very much as a resource recovery, a redistribution center, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is not just old junk on a curb. Um, other than that, I, I think uh, we're willing, we've got volunteers willing to help. Um, uh, we'll sign any waivers. Uh, need, you know. Uh, especially getting the place cleaned out, which seems to be the first step. Um, get a crew over there. I've got <clears throat> on our group somebody who's a carpenter. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm, obviously if there's structural stuff that needs to be done, we don't want to go in there in an unsafe situation, but if there's some easy pull out old insulation or other simple demolition work that we can do, uh, we'd be happy to, we'd like to know as soon as possible when we can get started on that so we can put together a crew and a time to work on that. Okay. Junk on the curb. I put treasures on the curb. Over in Hadley. One town's junk is another town's treasure. <laughs> 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 Um, all right, so I, I'm sorry we didn't have a little more for you this evening. No, that was important. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. That trumps, trumps, uh, but, yeah. but the good news is there are some simpler issues for you guys to deal with that also have positive impact. Exactly. Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Save this plate for yeah. me for one of our yep. meeting members. Yeah. Actually, if you just leave it outside, we have a meeting tomorrow morning. Just put okay. it on the curb. There'll be no curb. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry? They oh, won't there won't be any curb. <laughs> they are <laughs> amazing. I'm having another Oh, I think she meant I haven't out. been eating any sugar. <laughs> oh, was that a clue? Excuse me. <laughs>
You already had two and I saw it. Yeah, but you gave me a lot of grief over it. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No change. It's the butter. Really? And the chocolate. I've been eating vegan. No, she wanted to be here. She says, there's something I can do. And I said, oh, yeah. You guys didn't get any. We didn't be bought. I'm not a big cookie fan. I know. They're amazing. Well, the cookies are not reused. <laughs> so, okay, we're, we're, we we have a group. Yep. Let's mm -hmm. talk about a recommendation for street acceptance on that portion of Boggy Meadow Road off our old Elks Club. Mm -hmm. Oh, for the sake of discussion, I'm good. I mean, is this like a move of approval or mm -hmm. just a discussion? A recommendation. Recommendation. One way or the other. Yeah. Come on. Yes. You want me to get it started? I guess. Okay. Okay. So, it's my understanding from the hearing and the meeting we had with Wayne Clyden um, at our last board meeting that. Um, Boggy Meadow Road certainly hasn't been developed in accordance with the subdivision plan. So it doesn't come to us for approval on that basis. The question is, does it um, come to us for approval under the private way concept that we've been dealing with for the last year and a half? And um, uh, we've been told that the city has not maintained it in the past, um, that property ownership um, it seems to have reverted to the abutters so that there is no single property owner there. Um, and we've heard from the planning board that um, they're not interested in having it become a public way. And they're one of the abutters. So with all those considerations, I move that uh, it not be uh, recommended for street acceptance and that that be our recommendation to the city council. I'll second that. Yeah. David and I would second that. Okay. Any uh, comments or further discussion? All right. So the motion on the table is to n recommend that the city council not accept that section of Boggy Meadow Road as a city of road. Right. All in favor of that recommendation? Aye. Aye. Uh, then the claims committee for 1806 Burt's Pit Road and 31 Powell Street. The dyslexic. Or, or, or 1086. That would work too. <laughs> Actually, I am dyslexic. Oh, sorry. You said it. <laughs> A little overreach for that content. Yeah. 31 Powell Street, we were going to do three claims next time, but you need, after Ned looked at it, you need more time. So escapes is going to take some time, I think. Yeah. Okay. So we changed um, your meeting on June 11th to have two, the two that you voted on last time. So it'll have to be June 25th. Or which date are we meeting at a different space? Wait a minute. So we what? What has the three claims? Oh, we need to talk about um, that. The last meeting we had three claims, and 31 Powell was one of them to set a date, and you were only going to do five minutes. Right. But um, Ned reviewed them, and they need a longer time. Okay. So we kept two at 15 minutes for June 11th. And so then, we still come at five o'clock. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And but then the 25th. I need 20, to on the 25th, I need. They can do it here because I need to reschedule. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 25th. You don't have anything. Yeah. No, I have. I have Kate Howard on the at five o'clock on the. I know. I'm going to have to ask you to reschedule that. Oh, so we can when do claims at five o'clock. We can. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. So June 25th at 5 and 5.15? That's good for us, I think. Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so claims on the uh, June will be a month of claims. Yes. Okay. And then you just have one more after that, and you should be done for a while, I hope. Okay. Um, okay. Discussion of separate irrigation meters for water use. Do you want to um, 
table that for another time? Is that a I'd love to. I was trying to get a response out of Alan Seawald, and I was busy with some hearings tonight. We kept playing phone tag. Okay. So I don't have a legal answer for you on this yet. Okay. So I'd like a motion to reschedule that at a future meeting. So, so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to consider a sole source contract for a hydro, hydro gritter replacement parts to process distributors in the amount of eleven thousand eight hundred dollars. Source? Uh, that would be water. Oh, wastewater. Wastewater. Sorry. Enterprise fund. Sewer. Uh, <laughs> move approval. Second. Second. Any discussion? Any so this is a. Um, Bridge screw conveyor at the wastewater treatment plant moving bridge from the headworks into a hopper box. And they oh, have temporarily fixed it but it needs more permanent repairs for it. Uh, Jim Zimmerman sought out uh, process distributors who can manufacture this particular screw device. And the cost with shipping was the value of the contract. City employees, uh, wastewater treatment plant would do the installation of this piece of equipment as they typically do down there for most small repairs so it's just something that's ready to fail we need to get it fixed otherwise they'll be moving out of the grit chamber with bucket brigades which they prefer not to do any questions about this and this is um we're well, we're maintaining something we have to maintain you do. Is it consistent with long-term planning also? Well, the long-term planning was part of the alternative analysis, what we're going to do with the headworks of the plant, which hasn't been decided yet. But it's one of the options that they're exploring. Look, okay. but this is today's necessity. Yes. <laughs> Not tomorrow's <laughs> convenience. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, all in favor of approving this contract? Aye. 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 Um, stormwater flood control update. Do we have, was there, Something else on them on your mind? Oh no, there's not too much going on. We're working uh, pretty diligently on trying to getting uh, trying to get the billing database uh, uh, all set. So Andy Keither and Doug McDonald are working pretty closely with me. We had a meeting with um, BJ and Anne Marie uh, Levy this this morning to go over the coordination of the GIS database and how we're going to be entering all that information from UNIS. We're in a very tight time schedule, but. We're hopeful that everything will be in place for June 1 for the first round of bills to go out. We're trying to get started on um, issuing RFPs for the major capital projects that were identified as part of the utility. So by the time July 1 comes, we'll at least have some proposals and contracts available for board signature so we can get moving on, on some of the bigger projects that we have. This we, would be the core projects for the... Yeah, so the River Road retaining wall is one of them. We have proposals we're reviewing right now for that. and there's. Um, the flood control RFPs we're working on, the, the pump station evaluation and alternatives analysis and the levy certification work are the two that I'm working on right now to try to get those taken care of. And we're working on in-house plans for Connecticut River levy um, maintenance work that we're going to contract out. So we've got um, staff engineers working on that right now. So there's a lot moving for that new utility right now and I'm trying to make up for lost time. That's pretty much all we got. Any questions? <coughs> okay, uh, and, uh, your your memo on pavement projects. So we reworked the original draft memo that we sent around. I found the, the draft memo based on some comments that I received from the board to be not as clear as we would like it and uh, not as understandable as it should be. Um, the intent of the memo and the information in the memo is to make it available um, to the residents of the city so they can understand what our pavement management program will be for the upcoming fiscal year. We have about $2 million to spend on pavement related projects and as Terry mentioned at the last board meeting, $2 million is a significant investment in pavement and a lot more than we've spent in recent uh, time frame on that. And, that number is as big as the entire budget for the new stormwater utility. So clearly lots of work is going to be happening and we want to be able to uh, get this information out to people so they can see what streets have been, have been identified for what <coughs> treatments, what the estimated costs are and what the schedule is. Um, this uh, schedule that's in, this is still um, stamped as a draft, but the 
schedule items that are identified in here are current as of uh, today. We've got some projects up to bid. We have uh, a contract that we're ready to sign for crack sealing work that's ready to, actually the crack sealing contract I think has been signed, so we're, we're ready to get moving on, on some of these projects. And we've identified the streets where the work is going to happen. And then our intent would be to routinely have a master schedule for all the work that's happening on the streets. And then once we sign a contract with a contractor, we know what street is going to be happening, what time frame, to let people know. So if it's a contractor we're, we're working with, we would identify what the, what the schedule is for that work to happen so people know. If it's work that we're doing in-house on the box paving work that's described near the end of the memo, work that Rich uh, and, and the, the guys in the streets division will be doing, we'll provide up-to-date up to information, what date we're going to be on Falls Mile Road, or what date we're going to be on Audubon Road, etc. So people will know up-to-date what's happening. Um, the costs that we are showing in the memorandum are uh, the preliminary estimated costs as we work on the construction document that we put out to bid. We're refining some of those costs and we're finding that our more detailed estimate for some of these projects are coming in uh, at a lower price, which is good. So, oh, excellent. Um, so we think we're in good shape, but um, I think you'll notice that the format of the memo is a little, uh, a little more breezy, perhaps. So are you imagining that this memo, I'm just trying to picture, I, I like what you're saying. <clears throat> um, this memo would be on the website, and but it would be updated as the numbers become either uh, more concrete or as we have a date. Or right. Yeah, like exactly. It. I think uh, a number of the projects are going to be tied to a one main paving contract that we're working on that should be on the street in June. So a lot of things will fall out of that main contract. But, for example, the crack ceiling and the box paving that I mentioned, and even some of the overlay work, are stuff that we can start putting up-to-date information on the blog right now. So we can um, I don't know if anybody else does this way. I, I didn't get this until right before I came. I printed it off thinking I would have time when we were looking at streets. And instead, we chatted all the time, so what can I say? But I would like the opportunity to look this over. So do is it better that we just give our our comments straight to you, or do you want it to come before the um, committee? I mean, the board again. It's up to you. And maybe I'm the only one that didn't have a chance to. I didn't have a chance to. Read it. Yeah, no. I apologize for that too. It just went on. No, no, yeah, it just went it, it just yeah. happens. It's still, I understand. I'm just saying, what's our next? You know, because I do want to be able to. I, I'm not sure. Let me let me think. This is um, this is uh, added detail. Uh, it's it's not a policy per se. Um, I'm not sure that it requires us to give it our stamp of approval. But what were you thinking, Jim or Ned? I think it's just showing what we're planning to do with the money we have this year. Yeah. Um, it seems like an operational document. Just when do you think you can review it? I would probably work on it tomorrow or the next day. I mean, if you want to get me comments in the next, you know, next few days, we can make minor <coughs> changes. I think I think we want to get start getting some of the information on on the website, but we can do that even without the memo. I'm thinking about crack sealing. Some of that work mm -hmm. is going to be happening soon. Would let people know about that. But overall, as a document, we can make changes in the next few days and get it make it available. And I imagine the document staying uh, cohesive. In other words, not you wouldn't have to sift through a bunch of blog posts to see the details. I, I'm seeing a, a central document that just gets periodically updated, maybe with a note saying updated such and such. Oops. Sure. Um, so you, you always go back to the same spot to get the information. Um, I, I think it's great, Jim. Yeah, it's, it's a nice, it's a nice, it, it nicely advances the way we communicate with people about what's happening. I really like it, but I just want to make sure that I fit. No, feel free. What does the watermark RF mean? It means draft minus the D. Thanks, Harvey. Dave will let a, let a candy point to that out to me. You made it too Which big. I noticed was too lazy to, to fix. <laughs> Which is why you've got this old fashioned. That's, that's what I know how to use. Old fashioned <laughs> draft. High technology from the city engineer. <laughs> okay, thanks for giving me some. That's great. Um, 
And does everyone agree we don't need to have a motion? I agree. Okay. Um, next, reschedule the forest stewardship plan presentation with Michael Mori. Okay, I'm making a mess. I apologize up front for that. Um, Mike Mori would like to come on July 9th. If that is something. Yeah. Yeah. BJ's going to miss it, but she was I do. I love his presentation. I want to be here. <laughs> oh, and you won't be here? No. Well, let's move it then. Uh, but no. Anne Marie Levy no. would love to be here. She's she not would. normally here, and she loves the forestry. Yeah. Oh. It's so fine. It's a good switch. Well, okay. could I suggest you, can watch the tape. you go on to YouTube? The video. And I was going to say okay, that fine. we could tape it. Yeah. <laughs> I do. His, I love this. When show. you're rocking the grandchild, oh, yes. you watch the video. Excellent. Good idea. It's a little scary. She's been trying to rock us around the office lately to calm us down. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, um, and what's happening with the Tate and Howard? So, what's happening is they were coming on June 25th and then. I bought tickets to a concert out of town <laughs> on June 24th. I will not be back the 25th, and I just didn't feel right. Yeah, exactly. If I was, you hate to miss it. That's true. So I have other you didn't dates. Didn't feel right reselling your tickets? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> I love you guys, but no. Um, so I have three dates from Tate and Howard. I checked with Don Tata. He would be available on July 23rd, August 13th, or August 20th to come. Um, so we could just push that. Um, into the summertime. Uh, summer schedule. Yeah. And you'd, you'd like some so input on that this evening? Or? You seem to. Can we decide that? I don't know what your summers look like. But it's up to you. I don't know. Oh, so Sunny. was that well, an item you wanted to talk about this evening? <laughs> it was. No, it didn't make it to the agenda. But hopefully they won't be riding in the streets if we talk about it. <laughs> Usually July and August is when we have one meeting a month. In the so middle. I don't remember these one meeting a month times. I do. We, I do. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, we it's always do. It's my like a dream. Oh, no, it's back not. in the day, we, we no. really one slimmed it down. We slapped it down. That we most meetings being an hour long. Yeah. Oh, no, that, that that pitch. Never I remember happened. that. Oh, oh my Lord, Lord, easy. <laughs> uh, so, we, so you offered the, the second meeting in July and the second meeting in August. Either one. And I point. suspect there won't be a second one in August at least. No, he picked the middle of the month. Well, August, he picked the He could the do 20th. either one. He could do the 13th or the 13th. Oh, he said the 13th or the 20th. I guess that doesn't help him. We could make that our August meeting. I like that. I can't do the 13th. Well, you can have a meeting with me. Why don't you have July? It sounds July like there's 16th, some support for 20. July 30th. 20th. Well, I didn't say. No. Instead Before we continue, oh. would that be good? <laughs> do you want to table this or what do you want to do? No, let's make decisions. <clears throat> decisions, all right, MJ. When we meet in August. We're all on sugar highs. Are we thinking about an August 20th meeting? Is that what's on Just the table? I like meeting. the sound of that. Okay. Right. You do or don't? I do. I would like do. the 20th. I will not be here so the 27th. Right, that's far enough away that if other things come up, we're just proposing one uh, meeting in August, August 20th. Yes. Does that <clears throat> feel good? Yes. Have you got any concerts planned in August? <laughs> <laughs> um, He's going online right now. <laughs> But in July, we'll be for sure meeting on the 9th. Oh. <laughs> you take the whole plate. No, man. no, I don't want to. Oh. I don't want to no three. one's going to take we're the last We're all sugared up over Thank here. You. Okay. Um, ready to slide into Pulaski Park? No, what have we done about July? Oh, we have hmm? nine. As long as we're talking nine. We have July 9th. Michael Morey. And we have a whole month of June to reconsider July. We do. Good That's idea. true. However, we're going to take up some of that time in claims meetings in June. So <laughs> both meetings you have claims. I know. June's important. Okay. Almost overbooked. <laughs> we may not be able to talk about the second July. <laughs> until July 9th. I will not be here July 9th, but that's fine. I can, I'll, I'm happy to watch it on video. Okay. But I will not be rocking any grandchildren. Yes. Well, what are you <laughs> doing since you're opening up the We're rocking door. any <laughs> fellow employees. Okay. What? What we're we 
Well, just to tell so us at the moment we're still <laughs> looking at two meetings in July. Yep. Really? Well, because nobody said anything any different. <laughs> well, I said we have a meeting July 9th and we have plenty of time in June to have a second meeting if we think we're going to need it. That was my proposal. On the well, it's a, it's it's a five almost six weeks between that the 9th and the 20th of August. Sounds like a long stretch. So let's pencil in. Let's, let's see. So we're penciling in the second the meeting in July. Yeah. Okay. Is that agreeable to everyone? Mm -hmm. And the worst we can do is cancel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. I can believe we could pass up this much. And did Mike Morris suggest nine or twenty-three? Or I just have the ninth written for him. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You're right. We can keep talking about. Corey. Uh, <laughs> Pulaski Park. We had a second meeting, a uh, second workshop on May twenty-second. Um, with Stimson Associates. So the first meeting we had laid out plans of the existing park. People wrote what they liked, what they didn't like, and what they hoped to see in the park. We took all those ideas and sort of distilled them down into something that would be new in terms of a schematic. And Stimson came up with this, which is small and you won't be able to see it, but I'll describe it in, I'll describe it in a minute. They made this plan available to each table um, at the meeting at the last meeting and I asked people to do something similar which is to identify what they liked, there's a cookie crumb on that, what they liked, like those cookies, or what they didn't like, and um, things that they'd like to see that weren't addressed. So uh, we've got that feedback and we're going to, so you can see we're sort of coming down to a point of a design we hope people will support. Um, Terry and Mike were at that meeting and I would say that it was very well received. I think the, the residents were pretty excited about it. Um, we've been posting everything on our, we set up a website on the DW website for this project and um, it, this design was well received and part of the, part of the key part of it, which you can't, you're gonna, it's gonna be hard to see, but this is the, this is the current park here and one thing that Stimson is proposing is to push the back end of the park out into the roundhouse lot, so reduce the slope, put sort of a switchback uh, ramp there, and make the slope um, sort of shallow enough so that it provides usable space. So there's some areas where people can sit on the slope, this is south facing, so there'd be some plantings and trees and other things along the slope. And it would add, uh, it would make, it would ease sort of a, a, a stairway connection to the roundhouse lot, and this this switchback slope would be um, ex handicap accessible, or it could be used by bikes or whatever to make the bike path, the roundhouse parking lot, and the park generally a lot more um, cohesive in terms of uh, accessibility and use. Um, the design of the park, so this old, what they were calling the overlook in the back was something that people were very excited about. Um, a number of questions have come up. We've had preliminary discussions with the mayor's office and he's quite supportive of the, of the idea of expanding the park in this way. Um, so we're, we're continuing to kind of go down that road because the feedback on it was quite positive. Um, there were other aspects of this, if I can remember, the sort of a, a basic general green uh, space in the middle for gathering. And then they had uh, closer to the street sort of this Pulaski Plaza that they were talking about, which would be a sort of a scenario where you have movable tables and chairs and, and some other places where, where people could gather and, and chat and that sort of thing. Um, there's, a, there's a small stage, if I can do this, kind of in that area in the back toward, toward the rear of Memorial Hall that they were proposing where the Pulaski Memorial would be moved sort of to the middle of the park which That's was pretty well, yeah, and it was pretty well received by John Skabiski who's been coming to all the meetings from the Polish Heritage Committee, and he was excited about the opportunity to move to move that memorial <coughs> away from Main Street and get it to an area that's a little bit quieter. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty good. And then there was a lot of discussion about sort of play space for small kids, and there's a lot of, I think, consensus about what that should look like, but very little detail has been presented, and, and I get more I think I've received more email from people about sort of the playground for kids, people's ideas, what they hope to see, 
um, and that sort of thing. And we just we haven't presented a lot of detail on what that's going to be. Mm -hmm. I'll be talking to Stimson about presenting more concrete um, concepts in the next meeting, so that people can uh, can know what to expect. So a couple of things that are happening in regard to this. Um, I would thank Mike Parsons for reminding me that all these beautiful schemes come with no sense of a price tag at this point. So um, <laughs> did have a discussion with Stimson about starting to come up with um, order of magnitude estimating for what this plan is. We've been proceeding and in, in discussing with the mayor's office a, about a $1.5 million budget for the project as a whole. So we're trying to see how this fits in or doesn't fit in with that budget, whether it's going to be more or less and how, where the money might come from and, and that sort of thing. So we are working on, um, we're working on those, uh, some of those financial issues for the next time. Um, the next presentation from them will be what, I guess, I forget all the terms they use, it would basically be a final schematic design. So these are very pretty and cheery. If you go, you'll see they've got very fancy graphics. We've got their slides uh, as a PDF document on our website. So you can see what they look like. Um, but it's basically just, it's finger painting at this point. And then once they have a schematic that people are happy with, and then they start doing hard engineering design for bid bidding contract documents. So they want to have this nailed down to to uh, to be as close as possible because they really spend the most money when they start working on the construction documents for it. So that would be the plan in June. Hopefully it would be the last meeting on June 26th where we would present sort of the final schematic and then get further comment and then they would sort of tweak that if they needed to based on comments and then they would move into preparing construction documents. In the meantime, we're working on a state park grant, trying to get uh, up to $400,000 from the state on that. We've already filed one federal grant for uh, money that was about, it was about a half a million dollars in federal dollars. We're not sure if we're gonna, if we'll get that money, but obviously we, we submit it and we'll see where it goes. And then we're uh, looking at the CPA schedule for the fall. It's a little bit of a, you know, unlike some projects that come from enterprise funds, we don't really know where the money's coming from from this, but having a vision that people are excited about. That last meeting, um, we had uh, Councilor Bill White was there, and uh, Ryan O'Donnell, Jim yeah, Reese, and the mayor was there, for the, and they stayed for the whole meeting. And they were all really excited about th this type of concept, this idea. So, you know, that helps if people are, and, and the residents that were there have, have been pretty excited. When I've received a lot of email from people that are, that are happy with the direction and the whole process. So at this point, we're, we're pretty pleased. Um, how it all comes together, we're not really sure. Um, and we're also in the background trying to marry this project to the Upper Roberts Meadow Dam removal because we'd like to take the architectural granite blocks off of the dam and make them available for use in the park. Oh, that would be sweet. So oh, my. That was Jim's idea. We're, we're working with GZA and an updated yeah. schedule and Damn. Yeah, they're I mean they're beautiful, and we have oh. so many uses for them in the in the park. Mm -hmm. When I mentioned it to Stimson, they were just beside themselves. Like if there was any way, you know, we could make it work. You know, it would be it would be great linkage and you know preserve some history in a different way for the city. So. If I could just throw in a couple of things, if you would keep holding that, Jim. So the dog woods and the bus the bus waiting area mm -hmm. are going to get flipped and pushed over to the upper left hand corner. The, in other words, the um, the shelter is going to be in this orientation. Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, the Pulaski Plaza that he mentioned, with mm -hmm. attention to tables and chairs, those trees there are about eight trees there. Those are the understory is wide open, so you can look right past the trunks into the park. Mm -hmm. A lot of people asked for uh, a park that was much more visible from the street, mm -hmm. and the holiday tree is conspicuously missing. There was fairly reasonable support for moving on from the holiday tree. Really? And then that was a real sticking point under uh, Claire Higgins's group. Uh, some people were happy to move on, other people were like, oh, not the holiday tree. Uh, but it has a big, it gives a big opportunity to really open that park up to the, the front. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, following up on the little stage, which is to the right and toward the rear. There was some concern that that's a little too far back. Um, 
that there's a kind of a drainage swale with grasses that's running along that sidewalk, that major sidewalk running up and down the right hand side. And the stage is sort of looking at that. Um, so people couldn't crowd up to the stage if they wanted to. If they're going to be on the grass, they have to be on the other side of that wet area. So there's some discussion about whether that stage could move toward Main Street and maybe there's a, a way to work with that. Finally, and I have to admit this is me, but I was disappointed that that um, walk going down to the parking lot winds up over at the roundhouse end. I hope that they'll be able to think of some way to get it to more, instead of flowing into the middle of the parking lot, more flow toward the apartment building and more smoothly down toward the rail trail. But I, I have to say that's, I was the one who had that comment. So a staircase on that side still? Oh, I don't care. I just, I just wish that it didn't wind up. It, it, people are nice. being funneled into the center of the parking lot, um, rather, than the edge. rather than over near the edge, where there could be. You could imagine a nice walkway and some, some of a, a more <coughs> graceful connection to the rail trail. Look at that. And and I had I talked to uh, Mrs. Stimson. I guess I don't remember her name. Lauren. Lauren about taking, having that thing extend behind Memorial Hall just to give it a little more room. And apparently that's, it's our land. Yeah, there were different ideas about what to do with that switchback. Um, Wayne Clyden has been, has been advocating uh, pretty vocally to me, sort of behind the scenes about trying to drop a bike path in between Memorial Hall and the Roundhouse building. He says we own that. He thinks that the grades are more amenable to having a having a bike trail that would come up between those buildings and drop off in that area. Which we were going to shoot some elevations out there and take a look at the feasibility of that. But um, that's sort of an aside. The thing that Stimson liked about the switchback is that not only was it functional in in a gentle slope, but that there were features along it that you would walk down that. If, if it was just a long ramp, people would never walk down it, but there are features that people would use off of the ramp, so they feel like it would be a really usable space. So, but the orientation, we can take a look at, Terry. It, it, it's got great potential to open it up. I mean, I, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not poking at that aspect. I thought it was a terrific idea. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm curious about the future development of the parking lot. Is that just always going to be a parking lot? Or, or no? I know that that was going to be the hotel right there where that slope. Yeah, you know, I've, I've talked, uh, I met with the mayor and I've had a um, separate conversation with Terry Masters and the economic director, and both really excited about the idea of pushing the park back. Now, the interesting thing that the mayor has said is that when you talk to people about developing the back of the, the, the park in that way, they want to square things up in a way that would take part of the park and make it square, so like it, and then drop a building there. And what we're doing is we're actually squaring things up in the other way by moving the park out into the parking lot. But that doesn't really answer your question. The, an the answer to your question is, I think the mayor is a, a flexible enough approach in terms of looking at redevelopment of the lot to say, you could put a building in the roundhouse lot and it doesn't have to be on the back end of the park. So, um, you know, I think there are, there are issues with redevelopment. Um, and part of it is, in the past, uh, redevelopment has been sort of linked to no net loss of parking spaces, which, which results in the need for structured, uh, structured deck parking, right. which kills it. It really kills the financial aspect <coughs> of any project. Yes. So, if if the city wants to do some development there, I think they need to look at leasing or or uh, taking a piece of the roundhouse lot and not having that type of structured parking stipulation with it because it's, it'll prevent really anything from happening back there. Mm -hmm. So the mayor um, is flexible and creative enough to come up with another way to look at e economic development there while also looking at the benefits of the park. Um, I was talking to Terry Masterson today. He's beside himself about the great benefits to the community and the businesses if you have such a great a park that's such a draw for people. He just thinks it would be a huge asset for uh, not only for residents but for the businesses downtown. He's very excited about it. Uh, it all makes perfect sense to me. I just was, uh, since Wayne was suggesting doing a switchback and all this other stuff, I figured that the parking lot is probably not going to be something like a large building, and which is fine. I don't, 
have a problem with that at all. I, I, mean, I would think the value of the park in that location is far greater than putting another building there. All right. I think the mayor sees that too. He was really excited about, you know, what, and, and he said from the beginning, he was advocating for the CPA grant. He came to those meetings, and he was saying from the beginning that improvement to the park is a real priority for his administration. He really wants it to be something special for the residents, and that's every time I talk to him, that's what I'm hearing from him. Mm -hmm. Mike? So one of the thoughts expressed by one of the residents attending the meeting, and, and it got me thinking about it, is um, the DPW will have to maintain this. And so there are a lot of aspects of this that are sort of maintenance, maybe maintenance intensive. Mm -hmm. and, and so we need to think about that as the plan's finalized. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's very possible there may be some volunteer groups to help with this. I mean, I heard one table at the first meeting talking about sort of the gardening horticultural aspect of it. And if there was a coordinator, people could volunteer an hour a month. and it would probably work out nicely. You know? Well, I, we've had a couple of people come before the board wanting to do gard well, yeah. gard the food gardening project. Yeah. So I, 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 but there's more. There's more to it than that. I mean, there's yeah. There's the whole issue. I don't know how the tables work out, and and if they all end up at one end of the park mm -hmm. some night because a big group gets there, who spreads them back out? And, right. Or do they just disappear? Mm -hmm. But. Um, I think it's probably manageable, but it's something but we it need to be aware of. When we're considering fundraising, a Friends of the Park mm -hmm. concept, you know, where you get an auxiliary group, depending on the, the approvals, but because they'd have to be... It could be junior park rangers. With, there you go. <laughs> but it would have to be something that we would do in connection with the parks. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. But the idea that there would be a subsidiary volunteer group. Right. Would that be something that the bid could help coordinate? They've, they've asked. They would like to participate. I mean, they're interested in seeing if there's some some aspect of the Pulaski Park thing that they can be involved mm -hmm. in. I was going to touch on that with Terry Masterson a little bit. I'm going to be meeting with him next week to, to talk about a few things. And that, that would be one of them. We haven't actually met internally to talk about maintenance yet, but we're hearing the comments at every meeting, and we're, we're you know, and obviously we'll be responsible for maintaining it on some level, whatever the whatever the arrangements end up being. But clearly, if you invest a lot in a nice park, you want to maintain it. Mm -hmm. Find a way to do it. Okay. Next, Jen. Is that plan on the website? It is. Okay. Would you like a paper copy? I'd love a paper copy. There's a couple of cookie stains on there. Is this one okay? <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of cookie stains over here. Thank you. The little friends. Oh. Um, so that brings us to the conclusion of tonight's uh, <laughs> agenda. Short meeting. <clears throat> Gary, is there anything else you're hoping to talk about? Yes. Well, I don't need to talk about it, but I think I, <clears throat> there are some people in the Bay State Village part of town, I would like to have the Clement Street Bridge become an agenda item. <clears throat> They're aware that there's $50,000 in design money and they'd like to see the city spend it to repair the bridge, to get something going. And I, I didn't, they asked me about it, I didn't have an answer. It's in the capital plan from the mayor's office. Yeah. And looking for CPA funds for 500000 for restoration work. Would would we would it make sense for the, the department to start doing the engineering, a study or something to, to uh, be ready if if grant money is found? Makes sense that we to the budget passes that we had the fifty thousand dollars before we spin our wheels. Oh, so the budget hasn't passed on that's correct. Oh okay. I thought that was already that will be up coming within a month or so. Okay. So the fifty thousand dollars is on the capital plan but it hasn't been approved yet. That's correct. All right. I didn't know. It's that. been a recommendation from the mayor for approval. Okay. What are we doing with that 50 grand? Engineering study to see what the bridge needs to be done out of, right. what the next step of restoration of that is, or perhaps it turns into feasibility study what we should be doing with the bridge, right. rather than a restoration. Right. Well, there's a neighborhood group that's putting a lot of time and effort on, on um, uh, trying to find out how to, uh, well, I think they're interested in saving the bridge, the group that formed. They're definitely mm -hmm. interested in saving the bridge, and I think they're interested in the historic aspects of it. So, um, 
I don't know if it's, it's probably not worth making an agenda item if there's no money. Well, it's not yet, but right. I, I assume it's going to be forthcoming. We actually just, de the state just derated the bridge by one ton for two axles and two tons for five axle vehicles. So that came out of last year's inspection. <coughs> so that derating finally happened. Yeah, I just reduce it. signs waiting for signs right now. The, this proper markings have been put up away from right. more permanent signs. Okay. I remember in college that designing and maintaining a bridge involved getting from one point to another, which is something I always like to remember when we work on bridges. Getting from one point to another. Yeah, over something like a river, say, safely. Yeah. yeah. Where'd you go to school? <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time ago. It's longer than I'd like to admit. But I think some of those concepts are still valid. Right. So does that imply that the administration is coming down in favor of um, maintaining and continuing to use the bridge? Um, I'm not sure. I've had a depth conversation with David about that, but I think the 50000 could be looked at a number of different ways. And, and I know that the, the implications of the 50, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Is it a feasibility study? Is it a... I have to go back and look at the capital plan. Hmm. Uh, Mike? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Uh, we received the River Road retaining wall obligations from NEMA this past week. So we have 90 days to fill out the paperwork, get it back to them, and uh, with the review going on of the proposals that this new project will move forward this upcoming year. Great. Thanks. We had the most awesome event today. We thought Terry would be there. But that's okay. We had a little, we had an award ceremony down in the water department for the water department staff um, to sort of share the joy that Greg Noman and, and I had a few weeks ago when we shook the hand of uh, the DEP commissioner and received the, uh, the water system award that, that we received. So um, we've been working on sort of a ceremony for the, for the staff and uh, it went really well. It was just a, a brief little thing down in the water department. Ned and I were there. and. Uh, the mayor came, and, and Dave Sparks, who of course was the water superintendent for so many years, that led up to the success of us getting the award. Dave was back to work this week, and the whole thing was fantastic. And the mayor was great. He was a lot of fun. He brought his iPad, and he was taking pictures of everybody. He got everybody. We had, it was amazing because we had everybody in the water department there for this thing, which is unheard of. Usually, as a person out one thing or another, we had everybody on the back, sort of the the loading dock of the water department. And the mayor took a picture of everybody in the water division and Ned and I and everybody there and he was gonna send us that photo, which was which was great. So he was it was nice that he could fit that into a schedule and and uh, and sh he shook everybody's hand. It was funny. We made everybody we made everybody shake everybody's hand. We had they came up and we had little thank you notes for everyone. So they came up, I'm like, you didn't shake his hand, my hand, the mayor's hand. Um, so that we had sixteen people and I was like, You gotta humor me on this, you know, we put this thing together, you're gonna come and shake everybody's hand. Would have took longer if Terry was there, but um, <laughs> but but it was great. It was a great event. We were happy to have you know the mayor there and, and fit it in. And, and I think people were pretty. I think they were pretty pretty pleased actually. And we had um, gift mugs for them that uh, we bought everybody that says no water, no coffee, which, <laughs> which I explained to the mayor was my choice over the other thing which is available, which is a pint glass that said, no water, no beer. So, <laughs> a good choice. The coffee is a little more appropriate. Anyway, that was a lot of fun this morning, and uh, I'll just relate that to you. That's so, all I got. I'm good. good. I'm good. good. I was wondering how the flood pump station performed in the recent rain. I believe it barely even went online. So it never really took. It wasn't enough time to. They really got called in. Yeah, there were people working. There were people working, but it wasn't like a huge elevation peak of. They came in and ran the pumps on occasion to take care of the flows. It wasn't a huge event for them. Well, did they run two, all three pumps? I no, I doubt it. No. no. So it just didn't get that far. So, Rich just said the electric pump ran. Right? It's just electric pumps. Just oh, a small really? pump. So. Just, just, just to draw down, just to draw down the brook. Tremendous so. contrast. So to mostly the it's gravity flow at this point. It's all gravity. Flow. The Connecticut River is not in flood stage, so it just most of it just. Flows but occasionally, if if that 
rainstorm had been down in that neighborhood or had lasted longer, they would have had to turn the pumps on flood stage or not. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, blanking on his name. We've used the pumps about 300 times over the last 70 years. Um, Jim Dostal. Jim, Jim Dostal, yeah. I had Don in my head and I thought, I know it's not Don, but then no, the correct name didn't come. 300 times, so, you know, half a dozen times a year, mm -hmm. there's enough water coming in there, regardless of the, where the Connecticut River is at, right. that that little box channel isn't enough to let the water right. through. Right, right. So, okay. Yeah. Two things. First, I want to thank you for just now making a comment about the reuse committee because it's recognizing the political as well as you know, there's always the dollar, not capital, but the political and personal capital that we get from our community, I think is really important. And then second, I really think you guys did a fabulous job of responding to the people tonight. Nice. It was heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. well, really, I don't know how they... Mm. They love the Do neighborhood. It. What? Quick thought. Yes, Dave. Uh, since we had robocalls all winter about snow events, should we start thinking about them for water events? Every time there's a one inch forecast, maybe we ought to get up. Don't mm -hmm. drive through puddles and uh, well, know if, where your shut offs are and stuff like that. If that, if that, I mean, that's a great idea to take to that meeting. I assume you guys will be at the meeting if they. If it comes to that, they don't want to overlook the community too with the calls. I think it would just go to that, that neighborhood. And, you know, as you're looking at like what what should happen to respond to their their issue. The Bonnetuck Street got it. I don't know yeah, where. Yeah, Bonnetuck down at the down by the high school. I think they're so suggesting a larger. Well, okay, Elm Street. Yeah, not a neighborhood. It'd be hard to track a storm going through a neighborhood when no one's watching the storm. Right. Just a thought. Mm-hmm. Yes. All right, guys. That's it. We'll adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.